Excellencies, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, good morning, good morning, and welcome to today's public forum on Russia's eastward turn uh, implications for Southeast Asia. We could also call it the, the Russian Asian pivot, Russia's Asia pivot. Uh, major countries now have their own pivots, and, and we're looking at Russia's today. Uh, I want to first start with uh, thanking all, the, all of you for coming and uh, uh, Ambassador of Russia, I think we, we have uh, an additional speaker in the program that uh, not included. Uh, the Ambassador Barsky will also make a few remarks. So let us begin with, with the Dean of the Faculty of Political Science, uh, Dr. Ek Tang Saputana. Good morning to all of you and welcome to ISIS uh, Public Forum today on last year's Eastward Turn Implications for Southeast Asia. Another way to Call this seminar is last year's Asia uh, pivot. Many countries have pivot uh, these days. We all know about the United States pivot and liberalance. Today we will to look at last year's uh, pivot to Asia and its attention to the East. It seems like all the major powers don't want to miss being in the East. The East, as we know, refers to East Asia and Asia more broadly. This is the region where the growth and development and the center of the action in the 21st century will be. And so major countries are turning eastward. For last year, which is a country of vast landmass stretching from Asia to Europe. Turning east means securing growth and prosperity and being part of Asia's rise in the 21st uh, century. There are many geopolitical implications associated with last year's eastward turn and its problem and tension with Europe. The details and dynamics of last year's eastward pivot to Asia will be discussed here with, uh, this morning. I would like to thank to the speakers, particularly uh, Dr. Victor Samsky and Dr. Ekaterina Kodunova, who have traveled from Moscow to uh, here today. Likewise, uh, Mr. Bund Nagala has also traveled from Malaysia uh, to be here. I thanks Dr. Peter Chairman, who is senior fellow at ISIS today, uh, for sharing his uh, expertise uh, with us. And uh, of course, we have our Dr. Nathanan Kunaman uh, from the uh, IR department to join the discussion. Let me tell that this is one of the first and very rare public uh, seminars on last year at uh, Chulalongkorn University. Uh, in this regard, I want to express warm thanks to Latin Ambassador Embassy and uh, Ambassador Kilius uh, Baski for their cooperation and uh, goodwill. Last year is a really important major power in Thailand's past and in its future. We are pleased and eager to conduct more activities of this kind. We want all of you, uh, of uh, our major friends abroad, uh, to be close to us and for us to be close to them uh, in the right way and with the right uh, mix. 
here on campus, we try to achieve uh, th these aims by generating and exchanging ideas and views uh, in a constructive uh, manner. I think you will have a great intellectual entertainment and stimulation this uh, morning. Uh, many thanks to you all for joining us. And now I pass the floor back to uh, Professor Titinan. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I would like to extend my warmest uh, thanks to our good hosts, the organizers of today's seminar, for uh, the timely initiative to bring Russia into the focus of uh, academic discourse in Thailand. And I think uh, it, it was uh, right to do so. Uh, indeed, Russia is uh, turning its face to the Asia-Pacific region. But at the same time, I would like to remind you, the uh, colleagues, that uh, Russia has always been here. Russia has always been a player in this region. The interesting thing is that uh, the rules of the game are changing, and the balance between different players is changing. And uh, this region is obtaining new dynamism. So this is a, a completely new situation uh, in which uh, you, the academic community of Thailand, um, is very um, appropriate people to discuss what role major powers should play and uh, what kind of relationship Thailand and uh, ASEAN as a whole um, should establish with the major players in the region, including the Russian Federation. It makes me particularly happy that all this is happening against the backdrop of the upsurge in political and economic relations between Russia and Thailand. And uh, the last thing I want to say is to wish you all the best and every success in your exciting seminar. Thank you. Uh, just a quick scene setting uh, for a couple of minutes. We, we have until 11.30 and uh, we have about two hours and ten minutes or so. Uh, we have five speakers. I thank all of them for being here. Uh, we have two, two speakers from Russia. Uh, I want to say that when we talk about Russia, you know, we're very interested, by the way. The Prime Minister Medvedev uh, was here recently, and I apologize, we call him the President. Uh, but he, in fact, was the President. He is now the Prime Minister, so it's Prime Minister Medvedev. Uh, so, of, of course, uh, Russia Thai ties go back a long way. And I think that many Thai people have remembered uh, in their collective consciousness the Tsar Nicholas photo, the photo of Tsar Nicholas with King Ramana V of Thailand back in the 1890s and the early 1900s. So uh, Russia is a special place for Thailand. When we talk about Russia, we are also thinking about other major powers. Uh, Russia in Southeast Asia means uh, a lot uh, of Vietnam, uh, some Thailand, and other countries. Uh, we're also thinking about the United States when we talk about Russia in Southeast Asia, and China, of course. Uh, Russia is now closer to China uh, with the Ukraine crisis. Uh, the Crimea crisis uh, and uh, ongoing tension in, in Europe, uh, in what used to be called Eastern Europe. Uh, Russia is coming around this region. I think uh, Russia has now uh, some gas exploration in, off uh, the coast of Vietnam. Um, Prime Minister Medvedev also visited Vietnam, uh, apart from Thailand. So we want to we want to understand the fluid geopolitical situation. Uh, Russia is a main is a major player in this mix, but we don't uh, we don't know enough about Russian intentions, Russian interests, and and plans going forward. So for the two speakers, you have you have all the bios. So I will not uh, repeat, but they come from they come from Moscow and the uh, uh, international relations experts. I know Dr. Sumsky because he's come around before. We had we've had meetings here before, and he's really the the ASEAN man 
in Moscow, if you will. He, he's uh, the director of the ASEAN Center uh, in Moscow. Uh, so we will hear from him first, and then um, Dr. Ekaterina will then make a brief presentation, 15 to 20 minutes each, and then we'll proceed from there. So Dr. Sumsky. Thank you so much for your kind introduction, Dr. Tessier, and even more for uh, making the arrangements and organizing this seminar in such a nice way. Uh, let me say that there will be uh, some division of labor between me and Yekaterina Kultunova. I will make some remarks of more general character, which will probably give you some idea about how we see the, the big global and regional context in which Russia is making its eastward turn. Uh, and then Yekaterina will be more specific and will give you more details about this development. Uh, it was mentioned here a few minutes ago that Russia is making a pivot to Asia just like many other big important players. Uh, let me say that I, that I do not entirely share that observation for one simple reason. Russia is not starting its pivot at the same time, for instance, with the United States or as a reaction to what the United States is doing. It's a much longer story, but for many reasons, it is going in an undramatic, step-by-step uh, -step fashion. Russia, unlike, uh, unlike some other quicker growing countries, is tiptoeing into the region rather than, oh, uh, rather than, than quickly moving into it. Uh, let me say also that, for, for a start, that we are meeting to discuss this this whole issue in a moment when the, not not Russia or Asia, but the world are, I think, undergoing a dramatic change. And uh, in a very quick way, I would define it, define this change as a progression from what might be called three or four or five years ago, a gradual movement towards the multipolar polycentric world, and you know, now it's, this movement is no longer evolutionary. It's no longer gradual. It is assuming conflictual overtures. And uh, I'm, I'm not yet prepared to call this a revolutionary phase of movement into the multipolar world. But there are moments when you have a feeling that it is moving rather close to that. Uh, that's one thing I would like to, to mention before before proceeding directly to the issue of Russia's eastward reorientation. The other thing is that for Russia, it is a very dramatic moment of saying goodbye to the dream that it has been entertaining for the last three centuries or more. And this is the dream of becoming part of the West. Uh, I would not like to go very deep into that subject. We could have spent a special session on that. But here we have to thank the West itself for doing part of our job, in the sense that during the last year and a half or so, so much outrageous information and psychological pressure was exerted on Russia. And the picture of Russia's domestic development and foreign policy was so terribly distorted that I do not think any kind of reversal to the past in terms of you know, seeing, seeing, seeing ourselves as candidates for participation in what the West is doing in the world is impossible. Cooperation, yes. Pragmatic relationships, yes. But nothing like identification of Russia with the West. Having said that, I would like to, to state something which I think is very important to understand about Russia's eastward turn. It is not a replica of our relationship with the West during the last 300 years. There is no idea of becoming one with Asia. There is the idea of becoming ourselves in the process of cooperation with Asia, just like from now on. I think, uh, well, with, 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 all the, with all the possible fluctuations which will be dictated by the situation, by, by the developing global and domestic situation, we will be sticking to being ourselves in relations with the West. 
And if you want to, a quick definition of that identity, I would say that this is Eurasian, as distinct from just European or, or Western or just Asian. Now, uh, in that setup, cooperation and connectivity with one particular country uh, seems absolutely essential, and this country is China. Uh, if we look at it from the point of view of the movement towards multipolarity, then of course uh, we have we have to we have to state that China was very much the initiator of that of that global shift, and the phenomenal rise of China in economic terms is is what is giving substance right now to. Uh, in, in a lot of senses, to that trend. Although, uh, although by no China is by no means the only participant, and the and the only promoter of, of multipolarity. R the history of Russia-China's relations is such that it is, and and the dictates of geography and and uh, economy. And, and, and geopolitics politics as such that it is absolutely essential for Russia to build its eastward, to, to use the Russo-Chinese cooperation as the major base for our eastward reorientation. Uh, again, the whole point is not of becoming Chinese, and, and I think the impossibility is absolutely obvious to everybody. I think the whole point is becoming more Russian through developing cooperation with China. Uh, one important thing here is that uh, both Russia and China are bringing so much to this combination that the possibility of, uh, of something constructive and productive happening between them at this point when relationship has already become very close is looking more and more realistic. Uh, one has to understand that uh, when Russia and China are talking to each other these days they are bringing to the table more than just uh, their, their own national potentials. On the Chinese side it is the huge influence and impact that Russia has in the Asia Pacific. On the Russian side, it is it is uh, the, the immense resources and and the immense infrastructure and energy potential of Siberia and the Far East and Eurasia. When when we talk about or rather. When President Xi and President Putin talk about the need to integrate, to link uh, Russia's transcontinental railways and the Northern Sea Route with the two Silk Roads, the maritime and the land which China is developing, I think actually we are talking here about bringing together Eurasian and Asia Pacific integration efforts. And this is, I think, a project which, if Russia and China really get their act together, will be difficult to resist for their neighbors, either to the west or to the east. Now, talking about the potential candidates for joining the Russia-China combination and all that, uh, let's take a quick look at the countries with whom Russia and China sit together in the East Asian Summit. First of all, I think it is India. Uh, during their last meetings, one in May last year in Shanghai, the other just a few weeks ago in Moscow, both presidents talked about the need to involve India in the Russian China's projects. Uh, the presence of the Indian battalion 
on the Red Square during the May 9th parade was a very symbolic sign of the, alongside the, the Russian and the Chinese troops was an interesting sign that this is quite a possibility. Then, of course, we have to consider the fact that uh, Russia and China uh, are working together with India plus Brazil and South Africa in the BRICS framework, and that India is one of the first candidates for joining the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, probably in the nearest future. So all these are positive signs that uh, the further Russo-Chinese cooperation goes, the more the chances that India will be the third participant. How about the American allies in the East Asia Summit? Is there any chance that they may be somehow participating in all that? Well, Japanese position is ambivalent, of course, and of course uh, there was a re-emphasis on on the alliance with the United States during the latest visit of Prime Minister Shinzo Abe to Washington. But at the same time, there, are, there is a whole number of signs coming from the Japanese that they really want to join, the, to, to join this game on, in, in, in terms of participating in the Siberian and the Far Eastern development. And their energy needs play a very fundamental role in all that. Uh, South Korea is, has been also, especially under uh, President Kim Kim Kap, is uh, very receptive to, uh, to the ideas of energy cooperation in North East Asia. Then, of course, we have Australia and New Zealand, and Australia looks on the surface as a very problematic participant in all that, and even as a competitor uh, to Russia, as far as as, um, as provision of mineral resources and food to China is concerned. But let's say, who knows? Uh, I, I would not, if things start to happen between Russia and China, I, I do not exclude at some point Australian investments into the, into the uh, resources, uh, natural resources sector in Siberia as well into the food production because these are the major priorities that Russians foresee as far as development of its uh, Siberian and Far Eastern territories are concerned. Uh, New Zealand was the first country to start uh, free trade negotiations with Russia as far as uh, its Asian partners are concerned. Then these negotiations stopped because New Zealand joined the sanctions. But once again, uh, this is hardly the end of this, of this game. And New Zealanders have already uh, managed to establish uh, production of uh, dire products in Russia itself. And there is every chance that they will continue to do that, uh, apart from possible other things. Now, uh, we are gradually coming, but we are coming to the subject which should be of primary, in, primary interest to us during this round table, and this is Russia, ASEAN, and the attitudes of ASEAN. My first question here is this. Uh, is ASEAN interested in becoming a meaningful player in the polycentric world setup? I think it definitely is interested in that. What makes things a little problematic, however, is the fact that we are now passing through a very peculiar phase of oh, some kind of bipolarity on the way to multipolarity. And Russia is on the forefront of that development. So, uh, you know, with all the nice things which we always say about our dialogue partnership, the, the serious question is, in what sense ASEAN may be prepared to take sides in that tense moment? Is it prepared for that at all, as far as Russia is concerned? Uh, 
I would not like to start this conversation by, by quickly giving my judgment about it. I would be rather interested in, in opinions from the, from the audience and in a dialogue on this subject. I can tell you that uh, some of my most enlightened ASEAN interlocutors are telling me that under no circumstances will ASEAN like to, to take sides. And uh, history tells us that, uh, yes, probably, probably it will not do it. But my question, nevertheless, is this. You see, uh, during the Cold War era, uh, whatever was said about the neutrality of ASEAN, it was still obvious that ASEAN was taking part of it, in it, in a, in a mild way on the on the on the on, on on one of the sides will it do something like that right now or or will it refrain even from that uh, then um, the question is this uh, ASEAN uh, one of the one of the major achievements of ASEAN is its position of centrality in all East Asian regional processes in the search for regional security and in the development of regional cooperation. How conducive is this whole situation to the maintenance of ASEAN centrality? I think this is a key question because uh, on the ability or non-ability of ASEAN to maintain its centrality at this particular moment, its future position in the polycentric world if it evolves, of course, will depend. Uh, anyway, let me let me finish with a reference to a question which I was given when I was when I was asked to to do an interview for one of the international TV channels on May 9th this year. The question was this: What military? What what? Uh, further military cooperation between China and Russia may mean to Asia. Uh, this, the question was given to me in advance, so I was preparing to answer it, but interestingly, when the time for the interview came, they didn't pose it. But I was prepared to say approximately this. Uh, Russia, uh, no, uh, Asia, in my view, should welcome the developing military cooperation between Russia and China. Why? Because this military cooperation is not targeted at anybody. It does not have aggressive overtures. It is purely defensive. And the, the idea is to defend the existing relatively stable, stable milieu for economic development and for the implementation of the projects which Russia and China outlined for themselves. And if this happens, if stability is thus preserved, if development acquires new momentum, it will be advantageous for the rest of Asia and eventually for the world. Thank you. Uh, I want to move on to uh, the second speaker, Dr. Ekaterina. Uh, perhaps you all can also cover a little bit, very curious about the, the sanctions, the impact of the sanctions and the, the Russian economy. Uh, we have a lot of Russian visitors in Thailand, but the numbers have dwindled, have, have dived uh, drastically in a short time. Uh, so what are we looking at in terms of your economy going forward apart from your presentation? Is it possible to turn on the screen so the audience could see the presentation? It's coming. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Titinin, for inviting me here and uh, for giving me floor uh, to, to present my views uh, on Russia's eastward turn. And I'm also going to uh, speak about uh, briefly how what are the implications or what are the possible implications for uh, Russia and Thailand as a result of uh, this uh, eastward turn. So uh, I'll start to. Uh, Pointing out uh, uh, the um, the thing that uh, Russia Russian political leadership has been 
advocating the idea of uh, Russia's proactive stance towards East Asia for uh, more than a decade. Of, of course, we can say that uh, Russia uh, was and uh, is a part of uh, Asia uh, due to its history, due to the natural course of the events, uh, how Russia uh, was um, expanding territorially. Uh, but if we look closer at uh, the new, so to say, new history of Russia after the collapse of the Soviet Union, of course, Russia was uh, uh, more Europe-oriented, and as uh, Dr. Sumsky has uh, already emphasized, size. It, uh, it was nurturing, uh, nurturing uh, an idea that uh, in the ultimate countdown it uh, will be able to join, uh, to join the West. However, this, uh, um, this hope uh, proved to, to be wrong and uh, as a result Russia gradually, uh, re uh, gradually returned to, uh, in my view, more balanced foreign policy. Because a country uh, which has territories both in Asia and Europe can cannot uh, have such an asymmetric uh, foreign policy. Uh, so uh, there were several turning points uh, which made this um, this uh, rhetoric uh, more kind of reality. Uh, because, uh, uh, in the in this uh, in the beginning of the century, the idea that uh, the understanding that Siberia and the Far East required um, urgently uh, to um, to match uh, in their economic development the European part of Russia um, turned into more uh, implementable uh, for in, uh, more implementable uh, policy initiatives, and finally uh, Russia got the chance to host an APEC summit. Uh, of course, one can claim that um, just hosting an APEC summit is not making a country uh, a visible player overnight, but um, we can look at uh, Russia's uh, preparatory uh, actions in the um, uh, in in the in Siberia and the Far East uh, and mainly in the Far East uh, uh, for for the summit and we can say that actually Russia took this uh, opportunity uh, very seriously and uh, APEC summit actually for Russia has two dimensions uh, one external uh, inviting uh, inviting um, foreign partners to come and to to see to have the first hand experience of Russian Far East and uh, a domestic dimension to uh, to develop uh, this region, to uh, build a, a real uh, hub for the international activities in Vladivostok, uh, and actually to turn this uh, region uh, not just um, geographically uh, but practically to uh, cooperation with Asia. However, there were and still uh, uh, are um, uh, several obstacles for um, a complete eastward turn. And uh, I would say that uh, one of the key problems here uh, was the uh, Europe-oriented elite, which uh, really believed that uh, things and uh, business will be as usual even after sanctions. And um, this refers partly to the political elite uh, and to the business elite. So actually there were no uh, productive lobby um, a critical mass of people interested in dealing with Asia, um, ex except probably uh, the people-to-people -people contacts at the level of uh, uh, tourist interactions. Uh, but still, we, we, we needed more political will and more uh, real implementation of um, of this will in uh, in practical ac uh, actions taking place uh, every day. Uh, but then the crisis in uh, in Ukraine uh, happened, uh, and it um, made uh, actually it spurred uh, uh, Russia's um, Russia's actions in Asia. Uh, in May and November 2014, uh, we we saw uh, the Russian gas deals and uh, really in reinvigorated discourse of the eastward turn with more uh, practical uh, practical uh, state, uh, states uh, stages uh, of development. So uh, my key argument is actually that uh, the current international dimension constraints, um, domestic constraints, are uh, pushing Russia towards East Asia. And Dr. Titinan posed a question about uh, the economic situation in Russia, so how the uh, economic uh, 
dynamics uh, is evolving after after the sanctions. I would say here I would put this uh, question um, uh, to uh, that uh, second part, domestic constraints, because of course we have um, reduced uh, economic capacities. Uh, uh, both for acting uh, domestically and internationally, and of course the um, inflation which we had uh, as a result of um, exchange uh, rate um, uh, changes, uh, they they of course are not favorable for uh, for Russia as an economic player. However, on the uh, on the other hand, uh, we have. Um, signs of more uh, creative uh, thinking in terms of how to uh, find the financial sources, external financial sources, if, if we uh, cannot count on Europe anymore. More, um, you know, um, more out of the box thinking uh, about what uh, Russia can do in terms of uh, developing its economy. So uh, I see this, uh, this situation both in, well, positive and negative um, uh, sense. Negative, of course, uh, because uh, we, we used to uh, to rely on Europe uh, as, as a real partner, and uh, we have several success stories in developing Russian re European regions uh, thanks to the economic partnership uh, with Europe. Uh, but still, it proved to be uh, unfortunately Europe proved to be not uh, not a, a, such a reliable partner as many uh, used to uh, used to believe. So now I think that um, the, the positive aspect of uh, the sanctions is, of course. Uh, the impetus uh, uh, to make uh, to make people to make businessmen to uh, to make those uh, uh, who really uh, feel that um, Russia uh, should be a developed country an advanced country to turn to to Asia to look for more opportunities and I'm pleased to have a number of uh, friends and colleagues uh, who are really uh, Asian Asian people uh, in, in this sense so um, there are also a num uh, there is also a number of problems which uh, slow our eastward turn so far, and I, I would uh, probably uh, enumerate here three of them. Um, we have now a new, uh, the new Ministry of the Forest and Development, a special institution uh, to uh, to deal specifically with uh, the development of the forest. Uh, it's also a good sign because uh, before, and I will. Uh, briefly touch upon this question further on. Uh, there was a, an internal struggle, uh, a dis an internal discussion in the uh, political and bureaucratic elite how to, how, how to deal with the issue of uh, far eastern development. And finally, uh, it embodied in the establishment of the ministry. However, it, it's, still, it's still struggling with other ministries for, for competences though um, it's driven by, it's uh, guarded by uh, very dynamic people who are really interested in uh, pushing this issue forward. Then uh, we still have uh, the question how to how to financially support the development of uh, Siberia and the, and the Far East. Because uh, historically um, uh, we had several uh, governmental prob uh, programs uh, of Siberia and the Far East and development. Uh, those programs uh, which were enacted in the uh, 1990s, in the mid-1990s, the early 1990s, they uh, obviously uh, were not fully implemented because the financial situation at the time uh, was not conducive. Uh, but now we, we need to decide what, what will be the way to develop these uh, really vast territories. And then uh, finally the, uh, the question of Russia's uh, asymmetry uh, in its relations with uh, East Asian states. Uh, because some see uh, Russia's over-dependence on China currently uh, due to all the agreements um, and uh, bilateral meet, uh, meetings with, uh, which Russia had with uh, China. And I will also uh, briefly touch upon this uh, further on. So, um, I would like to uh, highlight again that uh, Russia's eastward turn has two dimensions, the domestic one and the uh, international um, dimension. And uh, uh, I, I will uh, speak about these two uh, things first and then uh, I will conclude uh, with discussing the possible implications for Russia and Thailand. So uh, the domestic dimension um, refers us to the pressing demographic and social uh, problems of the Far East. Because in the, in the 1990s, uh, Russia saw uh, quite rapid uh, depopulation in the country in general. But this process went uh, uh, faster, um, even faster in the, in the Far East. People were uh, 
uh, well, partly dying and partly leaving this region uh, to go to Europe, uh, to go to the European part of Russia, sorry, uh, to get more um, favorable economic conditions for, for living. So uh, physically, Russia lacked uh, those people who, who could uh, stay there in this, uh, in this part of the country and to, um, uh, to develop this uh, part of the country further. Uh, the second problem, quite pressing one as well, was the shadow integration with East Asia. Uh, as we all know, uh, the driving processes of East Asian development uh, was the uh, de facto uh, integration, the transnationalization of um, many companies, uh, the uh, cooperation and specialization uh, uh, processes in the um, in the uh, regional economy, which made uh, the uh, countries of East Asia really tightly interconnected. But Russia was not the part of uh, this de facto integration. Russia also has to struggle to become the part of the institutions in the region for for quite a um, long time. Uh, but meanwhile, uh, the uh, Siberia and the Far East were integrating with East Asia in the own way, uh, by, by the means of uh, uh, shadow deals, uh, uh, shadow integration, uh, which was not the way uh, actually Russia wanted to see uh, its uh, Asian regions, uh, uh, Asia, Russia's internal Asian regions um, uh, getting involved into uh, East Asian cooperation. And then um, uh, the really important pressing uh, problem for Russia was to rethink its territorial development framework. Uh, what, can, what it can be institutionally, uh, what can be a response to this uh, uh, problem of vast territories, uh, depopulated uh, uh, areas and uh, really harsh climate conditions. Uh, I still recall a very uh, graphic table which Clifford uh, Gaddy and Fiona Hill uh, present in their book uh, titled The Siberian Course, which gives the, uh, the low temperatures uh, which do correspond to the average temperatures uh, in uh, Russian um, Siberian forests and cities. And on the other uh, uh, part of this table, he, he shows that at a certain temperature, uh, metal is cracking but people are still living in Omsk and uh, well, uh, ha have some activities there. At a certain temperature, Napoleon was leaving Moscow because he could not sustain uh, that kind of uh, cold weather there. And people, uh, at the same time, at, at, uh, having these temperatures, people are still doing some economic activities in Siberia and the Far East. So um, we, we used to have um, a very specific model of economic development of these territories uh, during the Soviet period, but now the uh, rule of market economy, uh, the imperatives of um, East Asian integration um, dictate us to, to rethink quite quite fast, in fact, the territorial development framework. So partly the answer to this question uh, was the idea of uh, creating territories of the advanced development. This is an official term and a ter territorial development um, instrument uh, which the new ministry is going to uh, practice in, uh, in the Far East and Siberia territories with highly conducive um, economic environment uh, which is a resource expert as a means of getting uh, financial uh, resources and then uh, build up, uh, which can uh, help to build up uh, more, um, uh, more uh, production um, uh, frameworks in this region uh, which are not only uh, resource uh, expert oriental. Uh, oriented. Then, uh, what is about the international dimension? Of course, uh, we have strong Sino-Russian link now, uh, which is also uh, a, a questionable one because um, many foreign experts are stating that still this is an excess of convenience, as uh, Bobolo famously stated once, and and now this um, this uh, pattern is reproduced in many uh, academic writings in the West. But still, um, I think that uh, the the key uh, a characteristic of Sino-Russian relations is that it's not a matter of regional but of a, um, a global uh, significance. And that's why it seems that uh, uh, Sino-Russian relations overshadow Russia's uh, policy in Asia. And to a certain extent, uh, uh, throughout the uh, late 1990s and the first decade of the century, this was, this was really so. Uh, but this was because uh, Russia had a uh, 
an asymmetric foreign policy in general. That's why it seemed that uh, uh, China uh, is the number one part partner while Russia is not looking uh, at East Asia at all. Then, um, a as an outcome, we have quite weak economic links, or we have weaker economic links with other regional players, uh, uh, like uh, ASEAN members. Uh, well, quite better situation is in uh, our trade with Japan and South, particularly South Korea. Taiwan is now uh, also very much interested what Russia's this return will mean for Taiwan. Um, and the regional institutions, uh, uh, well, at a certain moment in the late 1990s, particularly, Russia started to pay particular attention to to these frameworks. Um, and here we uh, we have we also come to uh, to a question: what kind of uh, follow-up a PEC uh, might have for Russia? Uh, some partners would like to see more uh, more active uh, Russian participation in this um, organization uh, after 2012. So I'm coming to the conclusions. I think that um, uh, we can uh, say that still there are several debatable issues. So Russia's this return is not uh, uh, without uh, question so far, uh, not, and not only uh, parties in the region uh, pose these questions, we in Russia also pose these questions. So um, how the territorial development uh, uh, actually will go in, in terms of uh, developing Siberia and the Far East? What will be an outcome of the intra-elit struggle? I would like to hope that now we have um, more uh, down-to-earth understanding that Russia should work practically day by day to establish better relations with the, its Asian partners. And then we still have two levels of asymmetry in Russia's relations with East Asia. Uh, Russia's relations with China, we still need to put them on um, on the track uh, of um, uh, a really balanced partnership. And we need to uh, work really hard to establish uh, better relations with the rest of the region, which were neglected for um, almost uh, a decade uh, after the collapse of the Soviet Union. So what are the implications for Russia and Thailand? I think that uh, we, we uh, do resemble each other in a way that uh, we need to, uh, both to rethink our internal development and we need to find appropriate responses to the economic challenges, uh, actually. Uh, we, have, we both have strong impetus for the diversification of the, the foreign partnerships and actually we're at a, a very turning point uh, uh, now in our uh, bilateral ties because we have a chance to transform, to convert our good historical legacies uh, into more meaningful, robust economic ties uh, if we if we work uh, efficiently and uh, craft creatively. So thank you for your attention. Um, let me just ask a quick a quick follow up. Uh, either of you can uh, can address it. Perhaps uh, Dr. Sumsky Sumsky can address it. Uh, what are the Russian intentions or how, uh, in terms of the Russian strategic outlook, how would you like to see the Ukraine crisis be settled? And then what are the uh, outlook towards, what's the outlook towards the Baltics and maybe the Scandinavia? Uh, you mentioned two things very important, the Eurasian identity and the goodbye to the Western identity, the Western camp, and I think that's something that we read about, but it's good to hear from you in person. <laughs> Uh, now, another thing you mentioned is the, the China-Russia axis, uh, as opposed to the the Russia, the rest of Asia axis. Uh, the rest of Asia are more diverse and, and different concentric circles, but the Russia-China uh, very strong. This is uh, this is interesting because the Soviet Union and China had some differences, some major differences in the past, and had different uh, clientele. Even uh, China in Cambodia during the Cold War, Russia and the uh, Soviet Union in Vietnam. Uh, do you, and then India, you brought up India, India and Vietnam, probably the two most important countries, uh, Asian countries in the, in the orbit, yeah? Uh, India, I think, uh, buys a lot of weapons from Russia. And, uh, it, for us, India is also a major player. In, in the East Asia Summit uh, related and, and in the, uh, India's not in the EAS, but uh, it has a very important uh, uh, relationship uh, to, to, to ASEAN. So, you know, in this mix, where are we going? I, I know that we're in the midst of a global power shift. It's going to take about 20 years, 30 years to see the results. Well, but in the short term, in the coming months and years, uh, Ukraine, how's that, going to, how's that going to end? And uh, what are the intentions towards politics and other areas? 
I need to be brief, of course. So let me say concerning the Baltics and the Scandinavians that if they, if they think that the best thing for Russia is to forget about them, we are prepared to forget about them. We have n absolutely no uh, what you may call aggressive intentions or anything like that. And here I put a full stop because this is not an issue at all in my opinion. Ukraine is much more serious because Ukraine is not about Ukraine. Ukraine is about regime change in Russia. Ukraine is about exporting the kind of instability which was created in Ukraine into Russia itself. And then the whole thing is not about Russia, it's about China. It's about the kind of, well, close relationship that we have now with China and about the fact that as long as this relationship, this kind of relationship is there, it is impossible to encircle or to constrain or to, or to isolate either China or Russia. You have to split them and, or, or to uh, get out of this game, one of them. I, I think that, at the, and not just me, I think there is more or less a consensus on the issue in the expert community of Russia. And these are not lunatics. These are people who are basing their conclusions on a lot of factual data. That it's, uh, you know, since the end of the Cold War, uh, Americans were sticking to the opinion that Russia is incredibly weak, that it's, it is its own worst enemy, that, it, you know, uh, at some point in time it will just commit a suicide, and that will be it. This didn't happen. Russia started to behave like a living being, and uh, as a result, but, but still, still incredibly weak. So the Americans probably decided that, that before they start dealing with Ukraine, sorry, with, with China, it may be useful to do away with Russia and to create an unpleasant situation in the Chinese backyard and preconditions for its, for its cons constrainment or containment or whichever way you, you want to call it. So, uh, from Russia's point of view, what should we do? Should we sit idly and watch as pro-Nazi forces are helping Americans to, in, inside Ukraine, are helping Americans to execute their plans? I don't think that that's a proper answer to, the, to, the whole, to, to this whole scenario, although uh, there is no factual proof so far and Americans, with all their surveillance capability, had not provided a single fact confirming that there is Russian military presence in Ukraine. The whole Crimean episode, from a certain point of view, can be presented to the world community as, a, as an excellent example of responsibility to protect. No one was killed. No infrastructure was destroyed. The, the, the economy had remained intact. This is, this is a perfect example of, of Gandhian nonviolence, if you wish. So, and, and this very thing, and, and the population of Ukraine, of, of Crimea, sorry, is uh, more than 80% of it is, is enthusiastically supporting what has happened. I mean, and this thing is used as a pretext to, to create an, an incredible onslaught on Russia's on Russia's reputation, on Russia's prestige, on Russia's position in the world. So, I mean, that's, that's the importance of Ukraine. Uh, and I think from what I have said, you may conclude that it does not have strictly European meaning. That, it, that uh, the meaning of what is going on in Ukraine is going far, far beyond, beyond the borders of Europe into Asia. And let me, let me conclude by saying this, uh, Russia did not plan it that way, but it happens so that now it stands on the forefront of major global developments. And a lot of things will depend on the ability of Russia to stand firm and not to blink. And I applaud President Putin and, and his team and the people of Russia, in fact, for being very resilient and, and very, well, very, if, if you wish strong, in spite of all the assumptions that Russia is weak so far, and, and by not giving up, creating some major preconditions for sanity in international relations in the observable future. I will stop here because I, I speak too much, and uh, Ekaterina also has to say that. I would read just briefly for you two very important questions. Uh, well, um, 
starting with the Baltic states, I think that the overall situation is a good chance for them now to make themselves more visible internationally. Uh, well, I'm sorry that uh, they don't have any other means to do uh, this in some other ways, but uh, it seems to be so. Then. Um, about the Ukraine. I think that we would like to uh, to see a more constructive and democratic elite, but what we actually see now is a degradating political class, which is not uh, going uh, more democratic, more uh, constructive, more, uh, well, actually, uh, realistic uh, in terms of what uh, Ukraine is. Ukraine actually is a country with the economic potential of Germany, but look uh, what, uh, what kind of situation uh, it has now. Um, then um, I think what can be uh, what can be the outcome of the whole situation. Uh, I think that uh, any Russian uh, moves uh, to uh, to establish a more meaningful dialogue with Ukraine are now uh, not not really fruitful. And as one of our experts said, that what can we do uh, to let Ukraine uh, feel this uh, downfall in its complete uh, complete way? So Ukraine could uh, Ukrainian people could feel that they really need need Russia uh, as uh, as a good neighbor back again. So I did, I, I'm really sorry that uh, they have to sustain all this to go through all this um, uh, turbulence to to understand this because part of my family lives in Ukraine and I have you know a, a live show every day with news coming from uh, from my relatives about what is the situation in Kiev, what is the situation in the country. Uh, and I, I pers as a person, uh, not as an well, official speaker, uh, I really feel a deep pain for this country, well, how, how they managed to go in, in, this, uh, in this way. I, I, cannot, uh, uh, I cannot reasonably explain to myself. Uh, then, uh, as, for, uh, as for China, um, well, yeah, we had ups and downs in our relations, and uh, the crisis of 1969 should be uh, a, a real um, lesson for both of us. Uh, whether uh, this can be a result of our relations now, uh, I mean, the asymmetry in our relations as, as many states, uh, I don't seem so. Uh, it, it, I don't think so because uh, China seems to be quite. Uh, so far, it proved to be quite uh, responsive to Russia's concerns because uh, the uh, Silk Road project initially was uh, planned to, uh, actually to go uh, not, not not through Russia, not to uh, directly uh, connect with Russia, but uh, China uh, felt this uh, this concern, and we had a, quite a number of meetings with Chinese counterparts in the embassy and uh, in, uh, during the conferences. They really asked, "What, what is trouble?" you about this and uh, we, we see a counter reaction uh, the meeting uh, in Shanghai last year uh, there were not it was not all uh, only about the gas deals but also about uh, stating that uh, Russia will be included in this uh, in the Silk Road I, I still uh, I think that uh, there there is uh, quite uh, a potential for adjustment in our relations and I hope that they will uh, Go in this way. There, of course, there are questions. There are uh, debatable issues. But since the parties listen to uh, to each other, that can be resolved. Thank you.